This is a Jet 24, Fox 66, your Erie.com special report. Good afternoon, I'm Brian Wilk. We interrupt our programming to bring you a special report, an update on the spread of COVID-19 in Erie County. We go live to the studios of WQLN-TV. Here is Erie County Executive Kathy Dahlkemper. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me again as we talk about COVID-19 and our response here in Erie County. Unfortunately, today I have to report we have four new confirmed positive cases of COVID-19 in Erie County, bringing us to a total of 46 positives with 1,168 negatives. These new cases are individuals in their 50s, 60s, 80s, and one in their late teens. Two of those we believe are related to travel outside of Erie County and within the United States, and two are still under investigation by our county's health department. Two of these new cases are located in zone one, and the other two in zone two, which you can find on the cumulative cases map by zone at eriecountypa.gov. As always, contact tracing continues by Erie County's Department of Health. I have some good news. As of today, 22 individuals have recovered from their diagnosis of having COVID-19. Regarding the one case that was brought up yesterday who lives in a personal care home. Personal care homes are independent, more uh, intimate living, more like a family living type of setting. It's not the same as a nursing home, a rehabilitation center, or what we refer to as senior living center. There are just a handful of residents who share that living space. We believe that that home, that residence, has taken the proper precautions uh, to really eliminate or to stop the spread of COVID-19 within the facility. Contact tracing, as I said, continues and brings us more and more useful information every day. The state numbers today are at 27,735 positive cases and unfortunately 707 deaths. That is 1,245 new cases in the last 24 hours along with 60 new deaths. Warren County still stands at one case with Crawford County at 16 and Allegheny County has 925 cases and 35 deaths. So let's all continue our physical distancing, our very stringent 20 second hand washing, and wearing our new fashion sex accessory, our mask. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about masks in just a minute. Our environmental task team, forced, I'm sorry, our environmental uh, team has received 20 new complaints and continues to make field inspections to help life-sustaining life businesses remain open. So with a new order set by Secretary Levine yesterday uh, that goes into effect immediately, but enforcement starts Sunday at 8 p.m., we ask all of our businesses to develop a written policy on how you will comply with the order. It's gonna take a little time and some planning. So I ask you to please look at this now and in the next few days and decide what your approach is going to be to provide masks for your employees and have everyone in your business wearing them. I also want to ask that all of us consider our proper disposal of any masks or rubber gloves that we might be wearing. Unfortunately, we have seen a number of gloves and masks just laying around as litter. Please take your mask and your gloves with you. For example, if you wear them in a grocery store, take them with you and dispose of them properly when you get back to your own home so that anything that's contaminated would then go into your own garbage and out to the trash. Uh, the county will be issuing some guidance through our enforcement task team to the marinas. There have been some questions about marinas and people being able to get their boats in the water and such. Um, uh, guidance will be hand delivered to each marina owner regarding this. We have been able to get some clarification from the state around that. We believe that taking all of these precautions 
that we're talking about, including masks being worn in businesses, is really our first step in getting our economy back up and running, to getting back to work. So these businesses that are open now are going to hopefully be the leaders and help every other business figure out how we do this as we start to go back to some sense of normal. So if you need assistance with mask guidance, how to make them, how to wear them, you can find this information on eriecountypa.gov, at the cdc.gov website, and at health.pa.gov. And just shortly before I came up today, I went on to one of these sites and I found a new mask that, was, that we're also talking about. I made this today with a t-shirt and a pair of scissors. No rubber bands, no sewing needed. They have the patterns right on there for children, small adults, medium, large adults. You take this piece of material, you cut it almost like a little boomerang, you cut two holes in the other side, you put it over your face, and you twist it around your ears, and voila, this is actually more comfortable than the green one that I've shown you. So very simple to make. All of us can do it with a t-shirt, and I know we all have way too many t-shirts probably in our drawers. So please look at that on our website, eriecountypa.gov. Now I've had some discussions with President Judge Trasilla regarding masks because we actually, uh, even prior to the governor's order, had determined that we were going to require masks be worn in all county buildings. So I've spoken to him about that and about wearing masks and how that might affect the courts and the courthouse. So tomorrow he's going to be here to provide us some more information about the courts and about masks and some of the things that are happening within the court system. Once again, if you need more information or guidance, go to eriecountypa.gov, call us at 451-6700, or email us at ecdhinfo at eriecountypa.gov. And lastly, thank you for all of those who have helped us to celebrate National Public Safety Telecommuters, Telecommunicators Week. Those are our first, first responders who answer that 911 call. And thank you for sending them a note of thanks at public.safety at eriecountypa.gov. And now we'll hear updates from our hospital partners. And today we would like to start with LECOM Health and Dr. David Rubino. Dr. Dr. Er, Monsignor David Rubino, I'm sorry. Uh, Monsignor Rubino, are you with us? I am here, Kathy. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here, and thank you for your leadership through this critically difficult period of time. Uh, just a very quick brief report on our end from Mill Creek and Corey. We've tested about 70 odd some individuals. We are fortunately all right with personal protection gear. The LNR, the new facility we opened, is open. It has received a patient or two. We don't talk numbers, but they are open and operational. And that's really from our end about it. Other than the behavioral health people always remind me to remind ourselves that these are difficult times. And it's important for us to think how we talk because the language that we use is really important. And it's careful, especially with young children and not so young children, that the language that we use in describing situations is positive. Otherwise, negative language can truly tend in these difficult times to burden us down even more so than we are. So thanks again, Kathy, for the opportunity. Thank you, Monsignor Rubino. And thank you for that reminder for all of us when it comes to how we speak. Uh, Doreen Summers now from the VA hospital is with us. Uh, Doreen? Hi, Kathy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Here at the Erie VA, we continue to support our veterans using both phone and virtual appointments. In addition to our primary care and behavioral health virtual and phone clinics, we now offer our veterans teleurgent care. Veterans who are enrolled in VA health care can now obtain this care with a video chat or a phone call for issues such as things like minor cuts, rashes, skin irritation, maybe a sprain, or some back or joint pain. Using VA Video Connect and a camera on just your smartphone, excuse me, computer or tablet, veterans are able to meet privately and securely in a virtual medical room with a licensed independent provider or a physician. 
Veterans can access this care by calling 1-833-TELA-URGENT, or that's with numbers 1-833-835-3874. Another resource we're offering are social support groups for our senior veterans who are in need of added support or connection during this time. These weekly support groups will begin the week of April 20th and will open to veterans to be joining anytime. They will be available for about eight weeks. We continue to use our drive-through testing to test for COVID-19, but as a reminder, this testing is by appointment only for veterans who have met the criteria and have a provider order. All of this information, as always, is available on our main website, and we encourage veterans and their families to go to the website and sign up for email updates to receive this information right in their email mailbox. Again, veterans experiencing any cold or flu symptoms or COVID-19 related symptoms should call 814-868-8661 and press three for our Ask a Nurse line. The nurse there will provide veterans with appropriate screening and follow up instructions. And again, thank you for everything, Kathy, and a reminder, we're all in this together. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Doreen, and thank you especially for doing something special for our veterans who are more elderly and, and maybe more alone than others. So, so thank you for everything you're doing. Emily Shears will be with us next from UPMC Hammett. Emily? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Kathy, for inviting us once again to be part of this important briefing for the community. On behalf of UPMC, I want everyone to know that our hospital and physician offices are the safest places. If a patient requires medical care, we are here for them. While we are continuously ready to care for a surge of patients, we are also encouraged by the low prevalence of COVID-19 in the Northwestern Pennsylvania area. At UPMC Hammett, we're comfortable with our supply of masks, gowns, face shields, and gloves. On a daily basis, we are diligently screening all employees and anyone permitted to enter the hospital. For everyone's safety, we provide a mask to wear while in the hospital. Our collection site continues to see an average of 30 to 50 patients a day. Since opening March 24th, just over three weeks ago, we have tested almost 600 individuals and are seeing about a 3% positivity rate for the area. In our primary care and specialty networks, we continue to see 70% of our patients through virtual visits. The COVID-19 situation does change daily, um, so I would encourage everyone to tune in to the UPMC press conference tomorrow at 11. The link is available on our social media site. Again, we thank the entire Erie community. The amount of support shown to our faculty um, and members of the community means the world to us. Please know that our number one priority is always the safety of our patients and staff. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thanks for that update. Um, you're a great partner, and, and we really appreciate all the work you're doing and all everyone in your, um, in your facility is doing for our community. Uh, Dr. Wayne Jones is our, our final health partner who will speak today from Allegheny Health Network, St. Vincent Hospital. Dr. Jones? Thank you, Kathy. So here at St. Vincent, we continue to approve our facility to meet the needs of patients both with COVID and those many other health conditions that we care for here uh, at St. Vincent. Specifically, uh, we're working to increase our ICU capabilities. We're expanding our COVID-specific care areas and retraining personnel for areas that may be our highest demand uh, during the surge. We continue screening uh, and testing both our West Side Pavilion and our emergency department uh, for patients who are concerned they may have COVID. Uh, our supply chain uh, does remain sustainable. Uh, currently, we're using a peroxide sterilization technique to extend the life of much of our protective equipment. Uh, we have been providing and we continue to provide emotional support for our personnel uh, and employees who are experiencing stress, uh, both at work and in their personal lives. Uh, we do have a deep concern for patients who are not seeking health care uh, during this crisis. We believe they're placing their health and, and their lives in danger. Um, I want to remind everybody, our offices do use telehealth, so it's like having your family doctor in your home. 
Uh, we do have two urgent care centers, one east side, one west side, and of course our emergency department, which is more central. Um, we screen patients prior to arrival. We screen patients on arrival. And so these facilities are very safe. And so please don't feel uh, you can't uh, have your healthcare taken care of in our community. Again, I want to say thank you to the entire community, individuals and businesses, um, just a generous outpouring of support we've seen uh, to our facility. So I want to say thanks one more time. Back to you, Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and thank you for that great reminder, too, about uh, we have to take care of our entire health um, and don't ignore those things that you would take care of uh, outside of COVID-19. We don't want you to get sick in some other way. Um, so please use the telehealth that all of these entities have available to you. It's a great tool that we are very fortunate in this time of technology to have considering uh, all the, the crisis that we're in. And now I want to open it up to the media for questions and, to, and we're going to start today with the Erie Times News. Hi Kathy, it's David. Um, Governor Cuomo um, earlier today announced the extension of the stay-at-home order for New York State to May 15th, indicated the um, other governors that are part of the group, including Governor Wolf, might be extending that. I know the governor, Governor Wolf, is speaking at this hour to the media. Um, what have you heard? Um, is the stay-at-home order extended to May 15th, as far as you know? And, and what does that mean for Erie County? I have not heard anything about the extension in Pennsylvania, but of course, if the governor would order that, that would include Erie County because his last day at home, home order was for the entire state. But um, I have not heard anything different than uh, April 30th. Uh, Erie News Now. Hi, a question regarding the two patients whose uh, symptoms or cases rather seem to be linked to travel. Do you have any clue if that travel was over the weekend or just before it? Are we looking at holiday travel there likely? I'm not really sure where that travel was at or when that occurred. Um, but we know people have to travel for various reasons and we know people are still coming back to our community who were gone for months and, and so there's a myriad of ways that people um, could have been in an area where COVID-19 is much more widespread and much more community spread and so that's why if you can we ask you to not travel during this time um, and so I, I don't, but I don't have any further specific information on those two people and what, where they went. Um, talk Erie. Yes, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, it's Joel Natale. I have a question for Emily Shears. Um, I, this uh, constant of testing keeps on coming up on my radio show. Uh, understanding that there are two tests. There's the PCR test, which is the, with the swab, right, going through the nose uh, to the back of the throat. And then there's the serology test, which is testing for antibodies, but that's not effective until... 7, 14 days after infection. So given the fact that there are people, maybe even 25% of the population or the, of those infected, I should say, that are asymptomatic, what is the test for asymptomatic patients or does that not exist? Well, if an asymptomatic person is shedding the virus there would be a small potential that if um, a PCR test or a nasal swab was inserted, it could pick up or detect uh, the genetic components of that virus. So there is a small possibility. Right now, we're still seeing the um, tests are reliable for patients with symptoms. We continue to see those symptoms be fever, shortness of breath, cough, um, as originally indicated. But as far as if you're asymptomatic, uh, whether there's a test capable or not, um, there's just this tiny chance that somebody can be detected. Otherwise, um, the other mitigation uh, aspects of this crisis have to go into play. Yeah, I'm not sure I totally understand um, the question. But yes, right now, screening is, is, the majority of screening is directed at symptomatic patients. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Jet TV. Hi, Kathy. It's Samir. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, farmers and the, with the waivers, of course. Uh, I know a couple of farmers have reached out to me, and they're saying that a lot of their crops are kind of just rotting in the field because they don't have, uh, I guess, 
uh, employees to help field or man that. So I guess, what is your suggestion to that? Well, I would have to go back and look at the governor's order and the waiver list, um, but most entities that have to do with feeding our communities, which would include farmers, were actually on the life sustaining list. So um, I can get an answer from my team for you for tomorrow, but it was my understanding, you know, that if you were uh, growing food, if you were producing food, if you were packaging food, um, anything within that supply chain that you were actually allowed to keep on working. So I don't really have a good answer for you. Erie Times News. Um, yes, Kathy, I want to talk a little bit about the enforcement of, of the state order for masks. Um, what are the plans right now to, to try to enforce this? Is this something the Environmental Task Force is going to take on hand? Can you take me through what, what you've talked about with your staff um, since, the, since the state order came down? Right, so that order came uh, down while I was standing here yesterday uh, talking about masks and talking about what we were planning on doing. Um, and so we've been talking about that. We're going to have a longer conversation tomorrow around this issue. But um, I think it will be similar to what we've been doing with all the businesses that uh, have already been told to shut down or been allowed to stay open. And um, we would get calls into the health department and then we would follow up uh, usually start with a phone call and if a visit was needed we would follow up with that but we're here to help we're here to help our businesses i think we really need to look at this not as um, punishment not as something um, negative but as something positive because if we can show that wearing masks in these businesses that are open now and it making it makes a big difference in terms of the spread of covid 19 um, and I know a lot of people have been concerned about going to work uh, because they're in uh, working for a life-sustaining business. Um, gosh, we maybe could think about how could we open other businesses now that aren't on that list, and could we use this this tool, this thing called a mask, uh, along with the other tools, to get back uh, to the economy rolling in our community. So um, I'm anxious to see and I'm asking all the businesses out there to comply so you can help us figure out if this works and, and whether this is something we can utilize to get every business back open. So look at it that way. So we're hoping that we don't have a lot of complaints, that it's mostly people calling to say, I want to comply, but I need some suggestions on how I can do this better. And that's what we would be love to answering the phone and going out and visiting businesses on that side. And then it's not just for employees. It's for customers when they go in the store, too, correct? They That's are, right. Everybody. What I they are required. Yes, everybody should be wearing a mask in that business, whether they're working there or whether they're coming in the door. And um, even before this order came down yesterday, because we were talking about how we could encourage businesses in our community to do this, and I've talked to a few business owners, and they were like, gosh, if I could open up my business by complying with something like that, I'd be glad to do that. Um, we obviously need more masks uh, made, but they don't have to be fancy. You know, they can be just like this mask I made today out of a t-shirt. Um, and this was, again, so simple. If you have a pair of scissors and a t-shirt, you can make this mask. So just something to cover your mouth and your nose. And um, you know, there's great groups out there like Mask Erie and others that are making all sorts of masks, but of course we've got, you know, 278,000 people in Erie County. Um, and the nice thing about this uh, video, which we have up on our website, how to make this t-shirt mask, they had a, a template for even little kids. So um, that would be helpful as, because even a child coming into a business, if they need to go in, should have a mask on. They might maybe, for example, they couldn't use telemedicine, they might have to go into the doctor or, or something like that. We're asking people not to take children into grocery stores, but sometimes as a single parent, you have no choice and it'd be really, um, want you to have your child have a mask on too. So if these businesses can, um, can help us comply with this, we think it's really a great step going forward. And we will be enforcing this in Erie County government, although majority of the government is, is not open to the public right now. Um, Judge Frasilla will be here tomorrow to kind of address the court situation and how we're going to handle that, because court cases are still going on, uh, limited, but they are still happening. And every employee uh, coming in and out of uh, county government offices, which uh, many still are doing, will need to have a mask on and uh, be wearing that while they're in the buildings. Erie News Now.
Hi, a question for uh, Ms. Shears and Mr. Jones regarding emergency rooms at uh, AHN St. Vincent at UPFC Hammett. Wondering what you're seeing there in terms of people showing up hoping to get tested. We've just had a handful of calls of people saying that they're they're seeing a decent number of people there hoping to get tested as opposed to going to uh, primary care providers as uh, as protocol tends to suggest you should do. Dr. Jones, do you want to go first since this is kind of your area of expertise? Sure. So we are seeing patients coming in um, who are concerned with COVID. And we're seeing patients come in with other symptoms who aren't concerned with COVID. Uh, we do screening, and it's, it's very standardized. We, we go by symptom complex, so cough, fever, malaise, shortness of breath, uh, which we've noted before in this conversation. Um, and there's other symptoms, too. We see some, we've seen recently patients who have lost their sense of smell or sense of taste. Uh, which goes along with this illness. So there is a screening goes along with it uh, in terms of your health care screening. And then we do testing if you fall into that category. So coming in and requesting it to the emergency department, you may not automatically have a test done. But if we feel that you're at risk based upon your, your travel or exposure screening or your symptom complex, uh, we will do that test and follow up with you, positive or negative. Emily? Um, Exactly the same. We're screening all comers um, that prevent or present to the emergency department. Uh, we will do that test and follow up with you, positive or negative. Emily? Um, exactly the same. We're screening all comers um, that prevent or present to the emergency department for any type of medical evaluation. If they meet the criteria after being evaluated, um, we will make sure that they get the collection for the specimen as needed. Would you take me through your processes if, say, I showed up at either of your hospitals, if I showed up at the emergency room and it turns out that I was COVID positive but I hadn't been tested yet, what would be the process there? Would I actually get inside? Would I be screened in the parking lot and sent somewhere else? Just explain to me what would happen in that situation. Dr. Jones, you want to go first again? At St. Vincent, we, uh, we actually meet you at your car and we ask you why you're there. If we find that, that your, your symptoms are fever, cough, sore throat, something respiratory. Uh, we will have you uh, park and go into a tent area. And in that tent area, you'll, you'll be rescreened, either high or low risk. And then you'll be placed in the area which is separate from the emergency department, but into an area where um, you're somewhat safer uh, based upon your risk profile. And so you're in the proper treatment area for, for your needs. If you don't screen positive to any of those things, then you go into the normal area of the emergency department and have a normal entrance uh, for your evaluation. Um, once we evaluate you and we determine that testing is appropriate, we will test you. We will give you instructions. Those instructions probably will say, go home and self-quarantine uh, for at least seven days past uh, when your symptoms end. So you'll probably be at home for about two weeks. Uh, the testing takes anywhere from 24 hours to three days, depending on the volume. And if it's a, a weekday or weekend, uh, we do see some, some differences in, in uh, how quickly we get results returned to us. Uh, but we will call you uh, positive or negative and let you know those results. If the results are positive, we'll give you additional information on self-quarantine and follow-up. Also, just so you know, we also work very closely with the Department of Health. And if we do have a positive screen, positive test, we do notify the Department of Health. So please expect that the Department of Health will call you and they will check to see where you may have contracted disease and then, of course, trace that backwards. Thank you, Emily. When patients present um, to the hospital before coming in, they are screened with a series of questions, asked to clean their hands um, and put on a face mask. Um, then they come in and are evaluated. If anyone meets any of the screening criteria in terms of symptoms that Dr. Jones had mentioned, um, we follow the same process. Those patients are immediately escorted to a negative airflow room. That is so that it is a safe environment in terms of if they are potential COVID or if they've already been a known positive COVID, we would treat those patients the same. When a medical evaluation is done, the patient, um, if the patient requires um, COVID collection, um, we schedule that in our collection center either the same day or the next morning. It's a very fluid process that occurs very quickly, and they are given the same instructions um, from the state of Pennsylvania and UPMC to home quarantine, talks about what that is and what home isolation means. Um, after they get their collection, we do call all the positive negatives, and as Dr. Jones mentioned, we do report those to the state authorities based on the county where the individual lives. 
Thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, is that your, I'm trying to remember where I was at. I think that was Erie News Now. So talk, Erie. Yes, hi. This is a question for uh, Monsignor Rubino. Uh, again, a follow-up on my question last time regarding whether you're seeing an uptick in behavioral health, mental health issues uh, at Mill Creek. Monsignor Rubino, are you with us? I'm sorry. I always forget to do that. Yes, Shamir, we have seen um, a modest uptick in terms of behavioral health and treatment of behavioral health patients. I cannot give you an absolute number, but clearly the staff has been busy seeing, talking, trying to comfort patients as they call our behavioral health units. So the answer is yes. I just can't give you a hard number. Yes, thank you, Monsignor. It's actually Joel Natale from Talk Erie. But the the um, I guess my only other question is, what kinds of uh, uh, presenting issues are you seeing? Uh, I know that SafeNet is complaining that there could be uh, higher um, uh, you know domestic issues going on here. But uh, are you just seeing a lot of anxiety and fear? Specifically, I, I do not. Okay. Now you're muted. You weren't. Monsignor Rubino, you're, you're muted. You muted yourself. Monsignor Rubino, are you there? Can you hear us? We can't hear you right now. How about now? We got you now. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep messing this up. I apologize very much to you all. Uh, I would suspect anxiety would be high on that list, evidenced by the conference we had at the Jefferson Society two weeks ago. A lot of people were concerned about that, but I can substantively document that for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We're all going to become experts at this technology by the time this is over. So thank you for um, being patient with all of us here, uh, those who are viewing and listening. Uh, Jet TV. Yeah. Okay. It's Samir now. Uh, so my question is for the uh, medical professionals in the room. So with the number of testing, do we feel that we're right now in Erie County, we have uh, an adequate number? Are we testing an adequate amount of people per day, et cetera? Who would like to take that? I can speak for UPMC. Um, as we've opened it up to the county, there's really anyone that meets any of the criteria of symptoms that's had a medical evaluation or a conversation with a provider, we are providing testing um, to those individuals. So I think we're in a very good position right now in terms of supply and lab capabilities to be able to test anyone and everyone that has any type of symptom. Yeah, St. Vincent has a very similar experience. Um, anybody who has uh, sought out testing has been screened and tested as appropriate. Uh, so we actually have capacity uh, for, for additional screening. Does anyone else want to speak to that, the veterans? No, and I know Mill Creek has done precisely the same. Okay. And at the VA... But overall, do you think... Uh, Dorian? Overall, do you think there could be more testing done? that? I think that if a patient um, feels they need testing, if they seek any type of medical care and they meet criteria, they will definitely be tested. All right. Thank you. Erie Times News. Uh, yes, Kathy. I want to talk a little bit about you. You were addressing county finances yesterday. I want to follow up on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, at least a, a, an estimated number for how much revenue the county has lost over the last month, and what is the county doing to offset those losses? So I'm going to um, be speaking in just a few minutes at the Zoom meeting for uh, county council um, to give them a better picture of where things are at. But when it comes to revenue, it's really too early to to know what kind of uh, hole we may find ourselves in. And the reason is a big part of our budget is funding, funding that comes through the state. Um, we have not seen any uh, changes in that funding from the state at this point. 
but i think we all know the state is going to have some serious financial uh, issues to deal with um, as this COVID-19 crisis continues on and even when it's over. So we're not sure what that's going to mean for county government. When it comes to our revenue that we get from property taxes, uh, our property taxes aren't due yet and we have some property taxes coming in slowly as they always do this time of year. Um, my, many people's property taxes are tied to their mortgage, to an escrow account, and that would be paid automatically. Of course, we don't know what this might mean for those who um, have lost their income and they don't have a mortgage and they would have to pay you know, right out of their own bank account. And so those things we won't know though until uh, the revenue, you know, until the taxes are due and that revenue doesn't come in. So at this point, uh, we don't have a clear picture of that, but we know that there will be um, issues with some of the revenue coming in. So we are, you know, looking at a number of different uh, things that we are going to implement. You know, we are looking at personnel right now, and uh, we are having, you know, strong discussions with all of our elected officials about that issue, and and uh, with our unions, and we are, um, you know, going to be making some uh, decisions here very shortly. And when we do, and our employees are made aware of that, then we will let the media know what we have decided also. Hearing news now? Hi, one final question for you about the mask order. Um, I know you're looking at it as really a, kind of an indicator and maybe a first step toward a return to, to normalcy. How do you gauge success of that? How do you say, hey, this is really working? You know, what indicators are you looking at to be able to help so the second half of your question was quite garbled, but I think your, your question was how do we gauge whether the uh, businesses all implementing this mask policy, the current businesses that are open, you know, how, does this, how do we gauge the success of that, I believe was your question? Correct. Okay. So, um, you know, we're going to be looking at a number of different factors and, and we need to sit down and, and as a team, which we are tomorrow, to really talk that through and, and figure out um, those things for our own community. I think the state's going to be giving us some guidance on that also. But um, what we want to see is we'd love to see days without any new cases. We'd love to say if we do have cases, we can track them exactly to where the, either the person traveled or they were with a known positive. We still have a few cases out there that we're struggling to find you know, a direct source of that uh, virus. We don't have widespread what we call community spread or community acquired, but we know we have some. And so once, you know, we want, we want to see those things um, really end and, and know that we have contained the virus as best as we can. So those are the kind of things we'll be looking at, but we'll be working with our health partners, we'll be working with the state, we'll be working with um, just so many others, of course, the uh, very skilled staff at the uh, Department of Health to determine what kind of factors we're going to be looking at. How about uh, Talk Erie? Do you have any last questions? Yeah, one last question regarding the mask, Kathy. Uh, again, uh, we are, uh, the, the, you know, us reporters are part of the information. We're a life-sustaining business. But would you expect that in radio and television and newspaper also have to wear a mask when they're either doing reporting or in the studio, uh, everything except when they're broadcast maybe from... Yes, I would expect that everyone would wear a mask when they are anywhere near other people. So if you're working by yourself, if you're in a car by yourself or maybe just in a car with your um, spouse or children that you live with, you don't need to wear a mask. But if you are with other people, and this is what we're saying in county government, when you walk into the building, when you walk around the building, when you have any kind of interaction with another employee in county government, you need to be wearing a mask. If you go into an office by yourself and you're doing your work, then you could be on the telephone or whatever you're doing in your office uh, by yourself, you don't need to have a mask on. And so that's really what we are talking about is that everybody would be wearing a mask anytime that they are having an encounter with another person. And so, again, going back to what I've been saying is that it's the moisture out of your nose and your mouth that can carry the virus. You may not know you have COVID-19, and you could be spreading that virus to somebody that you are talking with, and the same, they could be spreading it to you and may not know it because they may not know that they're positive. They could be one of those 25% of the people who are asymptomatic. So for all wearing something covering our nose and our mouth, 
any time we're in the presence of another person who doesn't live in our own home with us, we believe it will do a, a lot and go a long way to stop the spread of this virus and also continue to do the things that we talk about all the time, keeping six feet away from everyone, washing your hands for 20 seconds, using hand sanitizer, um, and all those other good hygiene things that we've talked about now for uh, a month, easy. Uh, Jet TV, do you have any final questions? I do not. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for being with me today, especially our partners um, in health, and that would be Monsignor David Rubino from LECOM, Doreen Summers from the Veterans Hospital, Emily Shears from UPMC Hammett, and Dr. Wayne Jones from Allegheny Health Network, St. Vincent Hospital. They are truly our partners in this fight. They are out there every day working for all of you, and their employees truly are on the front lines, and we thank every one of them for what they do every single day to keep all of us safe. So with that being said, I ask everyone to please wear your mask, Please stay home as much as you can and to stay safe and to stay calm. And you've been watching today's update on COVID-19 from County Executive Kathy Dahlkemper. In case you just joined us, here are some highlights of the update. We now have four new COVID-19 positive cases in Erie County, bringing our total to 46. Of those new cases, uh, one individuals in their 50s, another in their 60s, another in their 80s, and another in their late teens. And she mentioned that uh, two of these cases are travel related and the other two are still under investigation. And she also made reference to the county's um, website's COVID-19 positive case map, which shows these cases um, to which zone these individuals were. She mentioned uh, two of the new cases are in zone one and the other two are in zone two. And she did mention some good news. She mentioned that 22 individuals with COVID-19 have recovered of have recovered from their COVID-19 uh, diagnosis. And uh, she also uh, talked about the new state mandated, uh, the new state mandate that would require people to wear masks when they go into essential businesses and she mentioned that on the county's website there's actually videos about how to make and wear those masks. So as of this afternoon here are the latest on the confirmed cases of coronavirus near us. Right now there are a total of 46 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Erie County. Now that's uh, according to the state website as well as um, what the county executive told us. Crawford still remains at 16 cases. Warren County still reporting just one case. And there are 26 confirmed cases reported in Chautauqua County, New York, and three deaths. And 36 confirmed cases in Ashtabula County, Ohio, with three deaths there. And there are now nearly 28,000 cases of COVID-19 in Pennsylvania. 707 people have died but nearly 114,000 people have tested negative. So the best advice is to stay safe. The best advice to stay, stay safe is to stay calm, stay home and wash your hands often and practice social distancing of at least six feet. And Jet24 carries a live digital exclusive coronavirus newscast daily at 11.30 a.m., 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. on our website, yourerie.com. And we'll have a complete wrap up tonight on Jet24 beginning at 5 p.m. And we are live every night at 7 p.m. on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Wilk. Good afternoon. This has been a Jet 24 Fox 66 special report. For ongoing developments, log on to yourerie.com. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming.